It's interesting to revisit my solo show Shadow Knowledge today. I set up the show in March 2020, right before the COVID-19 pandemic reached the West and California and Europe went into lockdown. Effectively, this meant that Shadow Knowledge, which is installed at the Nathan and Thompson Art Galleries at the San Jose State University, was open but then immediately closed to the public. My work still hangs there, gathering dust, way past its original closing date. In a sense, it became an immediate archive, or a capsule captured in time. I think it's very timely to talk about archives and time capsules right now. During the COVID pandemic, it seems like time has found a new form of elasticity, I find that I spend most of my time just pondering the past or thinking about the future. I don't make a lot of new experiences or work, but rather resign myself to maintenance and archival work. It was therefore a really strange experience when I'd worked for months to open a solo show. And then, right before people could actually spend time with it, to have it closed. I started to think on how to release some of these works online, how to kind of take these works out of quarantine. Some of the works developed by other shows, such as Picnic Pour les Inconnus, which was incorporated in Centrum for Net Art in Berlin. Whiteout was shown in Constant Dullard's exhibition at Upstream Gallery. And Queertech.io in Melbourne even included a whole walkthrough of Shadow Knowledge and its developments in Mozilla Hubs for the Photo Biennale in Melbourne, for which basically all the works were transformed and edited somehow. Which made me wonder what it means when a solo show immediately becomes an archive when the work inside of it is still alive. A thought quite similar to my thinking about a vernacular file format. Shadow Knowledge actually quotes vernacular file formats twice. And this is also why I'm starting this particular video essay with an introduction about Shadow Knowledge. But actually we'll go on talking more about the vernacular file formats. While the exhibition Shadow Knowledge will remain on display in its old form, collecting dust as an archive, accessible to no one, I would like to revisit the words I wrote for the introduction to the exhibition, which seems somehow as relevant as ever. So here we go. It's often said that all we have is the past to train with. And I believe there's truth to that. But some importance also lies in our contemporary state, To engage with contemporary digital culture means to be able to formulate a sharp and critical point of view, which involves analysis and active change through critical thought processes such as speculation. Uncovering and studying these spaces of speculation is of vital importance. But what is ultimately necessary for this is shadow knowledge. In the shadows, things lack definition. In the shadows we can find objects of unsupported dimensions and scale, ambiguous and fluid. The shadows are blurry and liminal, but ultimately potent spaces that can exist between the enlightened and the opaque, or the black box. Shadows offer shady outlines that can function either as a vector of progress or a paint by numbers. In the shadows we can rest, heal and recalibrate. Now is not the time for hope or fear. It's the time to look for new weapons. The future lies in the shadows of our present. During the winter of 2016, A joint acquisition between MOTI, which used to be the Museum of the Image in Breda, and the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam involved the purchase of a vernacular of file formats, which is a work of 
Digital Art from 2010. In a vernacular, also dubbed a guide to data band compression design, I explored the syntaxes of different digital image compression algorithms. I consider the vernacular as a starting point of my research into compression algorithms, which has become a main theme within my ongoing research-based artistic practice. I often presented my findings of this exploration as a rendered iteration presented in print, but in essence, a vernacular of file formats was never a static work. Rather, it was an ever-evolving catalog that illustrates the fact that every compression algorithm comes with its own bias, ingrained as a normally invisible, yet definitely not unimportant, organization of data that can be brought to the service of the image through a disturbance of the data file, or in a colloquial term, by glitching the file. At the time of the acquisition, the work had been shown in quite a few places. It had been shown in different iterations and forms, and particular renders had made their way into a variety of covers and other types of paraphernalia. And to my excitement, the 2016 acquisition would celebrate this. Instead of acquiring just one fully rendered iteration of the vernacular, Moti and the Stedelijk Museum would annex the entire archive. And this is how in 2016, six years after its first presentation, I got to consider and deliver an archive of a vernacular file formats. A main consideration became that the role of the archive would be a collection of documents, saved in order to disclose and present the work in the near future. So the archive would have to involve residues of the work and of its creation in combination and conversation with the final work. That is, if there was such a final work. And this is exactly where I ran in two main problems. The vernacular is unstable by the very definition of its materiality. The original files were digitally broken or glitched image files. So practically this means that the archive would consist of a collection of unstable files while the image data remains the same. While the image data remains the same, its reading and thus its looks depend on the software and the operating system, which change over time. Thus, the context in which the file, the broken file is rendered, changes over time, which in a worst case scenario might result in one time an image looking like a particular form and the next time you open it, it becoming a syntax error. And this is why the vernacular could not just consist of images, but would rather include the documentation of the action of rendering the image data in a computational environment. I recognized a second problem in the fact that since its first publication, a vernacular of file formats had evolved and even mutated and a few of the stabilized images had grown a life of their own, as I found unsolicited copies in some of the most unexpected forms and places. And when I tried to reclaim them, they would show me they had obtained narratives of their own. The act of archiving a vernacular of file formats had thus effectively added parts to the original work, and in doing so, it transformed. In short, the archive, so not just its materials, but also its meaning, is alive. The archive I finally delivered consisted of six components. The source video and the frames, a catalog of unstable glitched files, Monglot, which is a custom software used to glitch the image files, the PDF through which a vernacular was first released in a stable version, 
the stable printed iterations, and finally, the documentation of the prints and exhibitions. I delivered the archive as a 16 GB digital file and handed it over as both a .zip file and an uncompressed library. Then, earlier this year, I got the exciting news that the Stalic Museum base exhibition will dedicate one of its walls to the vernacular file formats. And with that opportunity also came some new considerations and problems. What can I do with the backstories that I've never disclosed, but I feel now, a decade later, have come of importance? How can I, a research-based artist, capture or update the essence of a living archive a decade after its initial conception? When working on that archive inevitably evolves and mutates this particular archive. In essence, where and how should the archive begin and end? Reflections and recollections on a vernacular file formats, the living archive, source footage. A frame of a video is part of a sequence. It stretches to the past and into the future, establishing a certain context. In the case of a vernacular file format, the source footage is one frame showing the face of a woman. The image is grainy, while its saturation seems to be reduced to a bare minimum, featuring colors of the realms ranging from yellow grays to great purples. The young woman has a French bob haircut and her hair is as white as the tones of her skin. She's lit from above, and while she's not wearing any clothes, the shadows of an overhead light fall like a collar over her shoulders. Her black almond-shaped eyes stand in stark contrast with her white features, and I think her expression could be read as bewildered. Her right eye looks straight at the camera, while her left eye slants slightly to the left. Her mouth is opened just a bit. That is what I see when I look at that image. A still from a video that was shot 10 years ago on February 12, 2010. In front of the bathroom mirror in my old apartment on the Kortelijtse Dwarstraat in Amsterdam. I was that woman once, so my reading is quite subjective. I was 26 at the time and I was quite heartbroken, looking for an image that could tell a story while holding a personal message. It was to be used as a main footage for the collapse of Paul, to be performed live on Danish television, a commission I had received with the aim to create a moment in time, to commemorate the end of the analog signal Paul, or phase alternate line signal which had just been shut down in Denmark and was superseded by DVB or Digital Video Broadcasting. But secondly, and in tandem with that performance, I also needed to send a more personal message, of which the recipient was a young man living in Lund, which is a small university town on the other side of the strait that separates Denmark from Sweden, where he could also receive Danish television. The last time we had spoken, he had told me that things were just not good enough. And I wished that this goodbye message for the signal pal could double as a last message to a lost lover. This dual letter is now forever folded into that single still frame of that young woman gazing at a mirror who has one tear sitting on the right side of her mouth. But these are just two of the many faults that contribute to the meaning of this image today, at least to me. For instance, the circumstances of creating that frame actually behold a far more physical or painful memory. That day, driven by a wish to make my skin seem free of impurities, and unbeknownst of the sensitivity of my eyes to the chemicals present in my particular choice of makeup, I had covered myself in as much of the white paste as I could. 
those dark eyes in that still frame are in fact so dark because they are bloodshed. And not long after capturing the frame, I had to visit the emergency room, followed by 24 hours of pain, panic and crippled vision. When a friend finally brought me home from the hospital, she told me, nothing is perfect and your eyes just taught you so. While working on the collapse of Paul, I started considering digital file formats and their intrinsic particularities. I understood that the choice of an image compression depends on its foreseen mode and place of usage. While the compression of an image that is meant to be printed will probably honor the digital image data to a T, making sure no compression aberrations take place, an image sourced for digital redistribution will most likely use an algorithm that will cut visually less relevant information away, this to enhance faster file transfer. So in short, every image compression renders the image data following a particular bias, benefiting its intended usage, while possibly rendering the file imperfect for other modes of usage. With that understanding in mind, I created a vernacular of file formats, a guide to databand compression design. And in a vernacular, I compressed one frame via different compression languages, subsequently implementing a same or similar error into each file, to let the otherwise invisible compression languages present themselves on the surface of the image. A rheology of data, or unresolved. In 2011, I first saw Bflix digital work between yes and no, a simple work that just consists of a line of data printed or painted on a long thin strip of canvas. According to Bflix, the work represents a one-dimensional data stream in which any synchronization cues between the data and the two-dimensional rendering service are absent. Thus, any one chosen two-dimensional rendering of the data which can be done by wrapping the strip of canvas around a piece of hardware, is just one of the many possible resolutions, creating a custom two-dimensional image plane. Between yes and no made me think of a rheology of data. And here rheology is a term that I borrow from the material sciences, where it is used to describe the study of flow of matter, or the science of deformation of materials. Rheology of data is a concept that involves an exploration of the fluidity of data, or the research into how we can keep data leaky and unstable. A practice I found important when critiquing the biased and exclusive architectures created by platforms. A vernacular of file formats is an exploration of the rheology of data, in which time might slowly deform the unstable parts of the archive, or, due to a loss of syntax, finally render it invisible. Inspired by Bflix, I created Unresolved. Unresolved consists of a 64 meter long line of data, which is only partially run on or wrapped over hardware. When hung correctly and rolled over hardware of the right dimensions, Unresolved displays a double-sided image, which shows the source portrait of the vernacular file formats on one side, in this case reduced to a 32 by 32 pixel image. While on the back side of the run data, it reads beyond resolution, encrypted in DCT, my cryptographic tool from 2015. Extra file. Because compression algorithms have become the governing de facto standards for rendering data, and platforms usually do not give a choice but to follow their rules, we usually don't consider a rheology of data. But as Kim Asendorf showed, we artists, engineers and other cultural producers do not have to abide by these rules. He created ExtraFile in 2011, which is a custom compression software, directly inspired by a vernacular of file formats. On the website of ExtraFile, Asendorf writes that digital artists and collectors deserve exclusive image compressions. Files should be personalized with custom headers. An extra file is a software in which the bits that make up the image can be placed in any way the artist wants. So in a sense, it offers the possibility to especially design image file formats. 
and to elevate them to a form of art, far away from mainstream or commercial standards. To release and present his compression software, Kim invited a group of artists, including me, to develop a glitched collection of extra files. The images I produced for the release of extra file were based on the vernacular of file formats source portrait, and I named them after Kim's custom compressions. After its online release, one of them, a Blink's portrait, started to live a life of its own. It got co-opted and reused, often without permission. I kept finding the glitch self-portrait on so many objects, from hoodies to record sleeves, and as the icon to a proprietary glitch software, or even the campaign poster for a Hollywood movie. It was used both as fan art and commercially, yet many of these appearances never accredited me. Once, in conversation with one of the users, I was actually told that they didn't realize the face was actually owned by a fellow human. In 2016, right around the time that I started to work on an archive for vernacular file formats, Elevate Festival invited me for a talk about losing the authorship over my face. They asked me to reflect on what it means when an image of your face starts to live a life of its own. Fascinated by the loss of my face and interested in the stories of others losing their face, I started looking for other women who had lost authorship over their face. And I quickly ran into the stories of color test cards. Collard test cards are the test cards with which engineers and uh, developers test the color settings of their image processing technologies. And they often feature a Caucasian lady dressed in a very colorful dress. My lecture finally evolved into an essay titled Behind the White Shadows of Image Processing, an essay that retold some of the histories of color test cards used for image processing, but also how these color test cards reflected a strong bias for the Caucasian skin. A bias that over the years and even until today has ingrained a racist bias into our image processing technologies. And this is how shadows are not just found on the back of the image, but instead are traced back beyond the image plane as part of the technologies themselves. Behind white shadows of image processing found a new form in Picnic pour les Inconnus, a desktop video in which Les Inconnus, or the unknown women, whose images are linked to the histories of image processing, present themselves. Throughout the histories of computation, Engineers used these female objects to evaluate the quality of image processing, the renderings and the composition of architecture to make these latent spaces more amicable. But while these women seem to be able to prolong their existence for as long as the digital realms will copy them, most of them have lost their name and identity. In Picnic pour les Inconnus, test cards, bots, virtual assistants, stock photos and others find their sound singing a synthetic version of Paul McCarty's We All Stand Together, yet they're failing to recover their personhoods.
Since the conception of a vernacular of file formats a decade ago, I learned that while digital photography seems to reduce the effort of taking an image of the face, such as a selfie or a portrait, to a straightforward act of clicking, these photos stored and created inside imaging technologies do not just take or save an image of the face. In fact, a large set of biased, gendered and even racist protocols intervene in the processes of saving the face to memory and as a result what gets resolved and what gets lost during the processes of resolving the image is often unclear. To uncover and get a better insight into the processes behind the bias protocols that make up these standard settings we need to come back to asking certain questions. Who gets to decide the hegemonic conventions that resolve the image? And why and how do these standards come into being? In May 2018, 
I lent the 2011 Blinks image to Vogue, the US fashion magazine, which I took as the opportunity to reclaim the image in the only way I could imagine possible, by renaming the portrait formerly known as Blinks, from a vernacular file formats, to a ghost for decalibration. With this small and probably most invisible gesture, I wish to take a stand against the discourse of color test cards and the loss of the face, to promote the consideration and creation of alternative resolutions. But the gesture of renaming an already existing image felt like it was just not enough. I feel a need for a more systemic decalibration of our images. And this is why in 2020, I created 365 Perfect Decalibration. For 365 Perfect Decalibration, I used a mobile imaging software called 365 Perfect. The software tagline says that 365 Perfect is the best free virtual makeup app, period. It's like having a glam squad in your pocket. The mobile photo app offers virtual photo makeup, which involves filters such as delete blemishes or brighten and soften skin and can deepen the smile or add virtual lipstick or lip tattoos. It can enlarge the eyes, make the face slimmer. It can lift your cheeks or enhance your nose, resize your lips. Basically, it can change anything of your face. In 365 Perfect Decalibration, I used the app to make myself perfect, not once, not twice, but in fact, hundreds of times. And every time I used the app, I would get one shade brighter skin, slimmer cheeks or bigger eyes. By resaving my newly beautified face every iteration, the artifacts of a recompressed JPEG and the absurdity of our beautifying standards are amplified incrementally. And by doing so, the work becomes an exploration of generation loss. I ask myself once more, who is responsible for the standard settings I use on a day-to-day -day basis? Who programs my perfections? Then, earlier this year, I got the exciting news that the Stalic Museum base exhibition will dedicate one of its wall to the vernacular file formats. And with that opportunity also came some new considerations and maybe some new problems. What can I do with these backstories that I never disclosed, but that I feel now, a decade later, have become of more importance? How can I, a research-based artist, capture or update the essence of a living archive a decade after its first conception, when working on that archive inevitably evolves and mutates it one more time? In essence, where and how should the archive begin or end? I first developed the vernacular of file formats to share knowledge and to create some awareness about how compression algorithms work. But a decade after its first conception, I believe that the archive should evolve from just informational to include a more active intervention. This is why I include an active reflection on the qualities and the natures of file formats not just on their volatility to degradation, but also on their inherent biases. I would like to draw a line to reflect on the fluid and recontextualizing qualities of the digital and the ever-changing and evolving meanings this involves. 